<laughs> yeah! I love your enthusiasm. Um, hi. Uh, welcome to the Nerd HQ. My name is Zachary Levi. If you don't know me already, uh, I, myself and my partner, David Coleman, we started a company called The Nerd Machine a few years ago because we believe in you. We believe in nerd culture, and we wanted to bring you a life brand, somewhere you could express yourself and say, I'm loud, I'm proud, and I'm a nerd. Uh, yeah. Rock and roll. And uh, kind of as we were on that journey, we we're like, well, Comic-Con's coming up. That's probably a good time for us to sell some shirts or something. And, uh, and how do we do that? And we thought, well, why don't we go and do this? Why don't we go make an off-site thing where... Uh, uh, letting Comic-Con be the mothership and have big kick-ass panels with five to 10,000 of y'all in a giant room and giant stars. And, you know, in, in addition to that, we'll go do kind of a, a smaller thing, an intimate thing, one where I can see who's in the back row and I can see who's in the front row and, and it's totally unmoderated and you guys can ask whatever you want, but don't expect every answer uh, to be what you want, exactly. <laughs> Um, and, but of course, the biggest thing about that was that giving you guys the opportunity to just buy your seat ahead of time and know that every penny of that goes to Operation Smile and changing kids' lives around the world. So, this panel, um, no surprise whatsoever, this panel sold out in three seconds, I don't know, what it, something like that. And uh, by the way, for everyone who opted for your standing room uh, tickets, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. With your money on top of everything, we've raised over $5,000 just for this charity, just for this panel. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is why I have Dave to remind me of certain things. Um, so so one, of our, one of our sponsors, Vizio, uh, is going to give you one of these. One lucky fan is going to get one of these televisions yeah. yeah, that's pretty dope, right? It's 55-inch 3D smart television. Actually, yeah. Hey, guys, I know some of you had uh, moved around and you were in standing room and they put you in some chairs and some people who were in seats who came in late uh, have actual seat numbers. So if we call a seat number that you, because that's what we do is we call out a seat number and that's who wins. If you got put in a seat that you were standing room, it's going to go to the person who actually has the ticket. Everybody understands that, Okay. Everybody's got to be okay with that. We want to make sure you guys are good, okay? Is that okay? All right, just checking. Uh, oh, hey, ask him for a number. Yep. Ask him for a number. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, could it be number one? Probably not. One, seven, three, one, seven, three. Yes, you, sir! You got yourself a television. Yeah, just come see Dave afterwards, and we're just going to put it on your back. Awesome. And we'll give you something, and you could do it. I don't even know how it works. Okay, so listen, I'm going to stop talking. I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. But more than that, I want to thank this man before he comes out. We tried so hard to get him last year. You obviously know that this man is the king of the con. He is the king of the nerds. He is very, very busy during this weekend. We are so honored to have him, and we're so grateful that you guys get to share this time with us. Without any further ado, please welcome to the stage, Joss Whedon. <laughs> Joss Whedon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. One, one, sorry, before you, I just, I just let you, uh, is there any flash photography at this panel? No. Is there any video at this panel? No. You better keep it that way. No. Just waiting, everybody. Hi, okay. First of all, um, I just want to say, I don't actually, I had to abdicate. There was a hostile coup. I am no longer the king of the con because a lot of us have been coming here for so long and not one of us has ever thought to do anything as cool or as useful as what Zach has done. And speaking for a lot of people, I want to say there's a new king or will rule as two kings like Tenacious D, a king and a not so important king, but still a king. Um, you guys actually paid to come here. 
that's terrifying. <laughs> um, I feel like I, you know, and I can't just, you know, just sort of blather on. I'm really going to have to bring it. Um, so, um, airplane food. Um, <laughs> well, no, uh, there, there's no such thing. So, I am going to sit here. Uh, sometimes I'll stand up suddenly. <laughs> Is that okay for the camera if I do that? Also, my little cold hearted snake. So, watch, I just, you guys be ready. Um, uh, I don't know, do, do, they, do they just raise their hands? Yeah, just you, you guys, okay. it's an unmoderated panel. It's all you. So, raise your hands and the volunteers will find you. I will and, be inspecting your fingernails as well. When I, so that, that will determine whether or not I choose you to speak. But you raised your hand first. Oh, there you go, right over there, Josh, right over there. What? Wait a minute, what? Right over here, buddy. Oh, <laughs> they have a mic. You, you lost. You failed. <laughs> See, already is taking power from me. All right, Joss. Uh, Dr. Horrible, sing along the sequel. How's it coming? Really well, actually. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, uh, I was explaining uh, yesterday at a panel. Um, we finished the day before we came out here and delivered Much Ado About Nothing. Um, I'm very, very psyched about. I cannot wait for you people to see how talented my friends are. Um, they can say all those funny words in the right order and with inflection and all kinds of stuff. That night, um, I got together with Jed, Marissa, and Zach and had our first like hardcore, let's get it done meeting about Dr. Horrible. We were already have a ton of songs. We got the whole thing laid out. We're just like, we're on the go track now. It's very exciting. There will not, however, be any questions where I will give involving any spoilers or math, even basic math. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's be clear. Okay. Sorry. Apparently raising your hand has nothing to do with it. Sorry. Just shout it. Shout it from the rooftops. Um, so I have, a, I have a writer question. Sorry. I have a writer question for you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> I have a writer question for you. Um, when you're, like, in the zone and working on a script, like, what's your process? Like, what's your day like? Do you, are, do you never sleep and you just get it all done, or do you have an ordered day, or what's the deal? Well, um, when, you know, there's a great deal of writing the script where you're not in the zone. Um, there's, there's basically two zones. There's the first part, when you're thinking of the idea, um, and I'm doing a lot of that now. Obviously, I have a little time to myself. Um, well, not right now, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, and you're just sort of, you know, thinking of things you'd like to see or what. It's all very ephemeral and it's very lovely and that's terrific. That's the zone. And that involves a lot of walking around. Um, and also watching things to steal from. And um, then there's actually figuring out the structure, which is horrible, painful labor. And that involves a whiteboard and pain and as many of your friends as you can exploit for free as possible. And then there's the third stage, which is the greatest zone where you've got it all figured out and you're just living with the characters. And for me, I'm just wandering, and I'm always wandering. So I'm going to do this. I just wander around, usually in a circle. Um, and I don't know what you've seen on TV, okay? But I, you don't change directions. <laughs> okay? That's, you see someone do that, they're not really a writer. Um, and just sort of live the conversation. I don't tend to write first drafts of scenes. I tend not to write anything until they've, they're done talking. So I'm basically just listening to them go. And they're awesome. And then, uh, and then I write it down. It's beautiful. The rest is work. Hi, Joss. Um, I was wondering what particular directors or writers inspired uh, you to do what you do. Which writers inspired me? I, I like to think that it was, it was incredible laziness that inspired me to become a writer um, and my inability with the math thing. Um, but uh, this is, I'm having kind of a Marilyn Monroe moment here. I'm, it's, not, it's, it's a little unseemly, I apologize. Um, you know, uh, the greatest writers for me uh, to read, you know, what's going on? Oh, no. <laughs> We're full service around here, full service, folks. That's great, because everybody here is having a little seven-year itch going on. Um, Dickens, obviously, not just Stan Lee, but like the whole Marvel stable 
the guys that don't get mentioned that often, like Steve Gerber and Roy Thomas and the people who were right in the 70s, Steve Lang, just all of those guys, huge influence. Um, I'm a fan of Shakespeare. I like a lot of things very much, but I'm gonna have to say, you know, it, my father and mother, my father was a professional writer. My mother spent all of her time when she wasn't teaching writing novels um, that were not published, but the sound of her typewriter is probably the thing that I treasure most in my head. And I remember it really well because when that sound was going, if any of us made any noise, she would kill us. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, ultimately they, you know, they, they had, they read constantly, they wrote constantly, they, I was surrounded by writers, it was like I was raised I, by a troupe of comedy writers. It's like, you know, I'm like Tarzan, only less civilized. <laughs> and, um, uh, and just having that around you, more than any other particular writer, uh, is the thing that gets me. But I'm also gonna say Frank Herbert. <laughs> okay. Tom? I was wondering if you uh, were aware of the Loki fandom, um, and if you anticipated that while you were making The Avengers. Uh, the who, the what do you know? I'm sorry, I'm having a little <laughs> trouble hearing with the sound system, so the what do you fandom? The Loki fandom. <laughs> Are you implying that some girls think that Loki is sexy? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've hugged him. <laughs> Awkwardly and for too long. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, is there something particular about it besides the fact that Hiddleston is a stud and that the character's really cool and evil? Okay. You know, I actually saw Tom uh, in a production of Othello that Chiwetel Ejiofor did years before he got Loki. Um, and he was playing Cassio, which is an incredibly unmemorable role most of the time. And everybody was like, who is that guy? First of all, he was you know, about like this, he looked like a, a crane. And, um, and uh, um, he just, he makes that impression. So no, I wasn't surprised when he got the part. I wasn't surprised when he blew the doors off every scene I gave him, and I wasn't surprised when the ladies all wanted Loki <laughs> to get lucky. So, ah, you got it. Okay. Microphone. Um, so I was wondering, since you got to write all these characters, if you've ever had an inkling of wanting to play the characters and take their costumes home, <laughs> this could be bad on so many levels. Are children watching this? Just, okay. so, okay. Sure. All right. Um, okay. Uh, we're we're going to skip the take the costumes home part um, and go directly to the I want to play every character. I always want to play every character. I am a super total wannabe. And I believe that that is actually really important for both a writer and a director. Um, for a writer, if you're a wannabe actor, and there are certain reasons why I chose writing over acting. Um, as a career, I own a mirror, and um, <laughs> I'm, aww. Aww. <laughs> and I'm afraid of people. So um, writing, seems, writing seems to be the, also the most fun. Uh, possible, but when you're a wannabe actor, um, you you speak the speech. You don't just write down the words and go, okay, now say it. It's in your head. You're listening to it. You're doing. You play every. I, I have gotten to play every part. Not all the outfits. Maybe when I drop a few pounds, but I have played everyone because you have to. And what's great about that? What's actually useful about that is that um, you're speaking these sentences. And even you know, if you're writing television. Sometimes I'll spend the weekend on a set writing a scene so I know how long it takes to get from A to B and how, much, how many words I can put between those because you can be that specific. If I'm writing a fight scene, very often I will fall to the ground. Um, if I'm writing a crying scene, I have to stop after 90 minutes because I have to stop crying. Um, you just, you get into it. And then when it goes to the actors, there is, you know, there's a way, there's a lot of like very cool sounding sentences that 
cannot be spoken by the human tongue, that just have a broken rhythm, that don't quite work. And if you've been saying it over and over in your head um, or out loud in an outfit, then um, when the actors get it, uh, it's usually much better for them. For directing, the wannabe thing goes way beyond acting. I think it is a director's job to secretly wish they had everybody else's job. Not to think that they're better at it, but just to really wish they could do it. Because I want to be the costumer, I want to design the props, I want to be the stunt guy, I want to do all their jobs. And if you don't want to do their jobs, then you don't really care about what they're doing, and it's going to slide, and people are going to notice. So, yeah, I am. Yeah, I want to play some parts. I'd like to be Spike. <laughs> or as we now call him, Loki. Hi, I'm Marcia from Weednopolis.com. <laughs> Quick question regarding Dr. Horrible 2. Will you be releasing it as a feature or a web series, or have you not made up your mind yet? We're thinking acrylic painting. <laughs> um, I'm always challenging myself. Um, you know, we don't know. We really don't. But... Um, it's very important to us to keep the ethos of what we did before. So our first instinct is to try and create it on the same terms and deliver it in the same fashion. That's how we're building it in our minds. But we're always keeping ourselves, what we refer to as sort of, not just media, but budget agnostic, where we're just in the act of creating, just making sure the songs hit, the story works, the actors are available, and you know all the things that we need to do, and then we'll get to that. But we're very... We're very firm about what that meant besides being an entertainment. You know, we made it during the strike um, as a way to say that we could work without the giant corporations that were trying to squeeze the unions out of existence. And it's really important. <laughs> and uh, there was a moment where we, because we don't know the technology, we didn't really know the world that well, where we almost lost our way and sort of caved in to a more traditional way of releasing Dr. Horrible, but I'm happy to say Felicia Day was in the house and she stepped in and said, I thought that we were trying to do this. And since she knows everything, because she's a robot from the future, um, uh, she, um, she sort of helped us in. So yeah, we don't know for sure exactly how it's gonna be, but that's what we wanna do. We wanna, we wanna continue to make the statement that Dr. Horrible himself was so bad at making. Hi. He, over here. Hey. Uh, congratulations on Avengers. Thank you. <laughs> but um, I wanted to thank you for Buffy. Forever and ever. <laughs> um, sorry, I cry a lot. <laughs> I can't believe I'm... This is so embarrassing. Anyway, I read yesterday that you... That um, Avengers, Avengers 2 wasn't a lockdown for you. What would make it a lockdown for you? Because I want to see that. I'm sorry, was it what for me? What would make Avengers a lockdown for you to work on? Because I want to see that. Avengers oh, 2. Oh, Avengers, Avengers 2, 2. yeah. yeah. Um, I'd need some Avengers. I think it's, it would it'd be weird if it was just a bunch of Defenders or X-Men. I think that would be wrong. Um, you know, I honestly, uh, obviously, there has to be another story to tell. It can't just be a convenient thing with, with, a, with a release date. It has to be worth doing, not just as well, but better. Um, because if you're not trying to do that, then why are you, why are you doing it at all? Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't really, I'm so, for you guys, it's been a couple of months since that movie came out. For me, a heartbeat. I don't, I don't really know what, where I am or what's going on or, um, I think this is a nightmare, and uh, <laughs> am I naked? Are, are any of you my ex-girlfriends? <laughs> More than will admit. No, so um, I don't know, uh, but I would say that most, the most important thing is going to be, you know, do we have more to say? Because it's a huge amount of work if you're not saying something. And if you're not saying something, it's just bricklaying. It's just work. There's no, there's no zone. There's no happy place. 
Hi, my name is Bree. Um, I was wondering if you had any new ideas for any new shows that you plan on doing or... <laughs> I don't think uh, <laughs> you're very aware of my work, but <laughs> it's very clear from the comic books, the movies, and all the other things that I just run the old ideas into the ground, okay? <laughs> I, no, actually I do. Um, and I'm going to tell all of them to you right now. <laughs> no. Just the ex-girlfriends. We'll, we'll meet up later. Um, no, uh, yeah, I really do, actually. Um, I, what I don't have is that, oh, Hollywood, you're paying attention now? Well, I have to have this script. Uh, I don't have that. I have a bunch of things that are, you know, I'm still in that first stage of the ether where they all seem really cool, and I don't know which, which one is going to be next, which is very exciting. I am working. I'm going from here to London to meet with Warren Ellis to start really booting up uh, Wastelanders as well. And we're working on Dr. Horrible, those are for sure. But then beyond that, I have a bunch of stuff. It's all really good, I think. Um, but I can't tell you anything about it. You just have to believe me, you have to trust me. And we always trust you. <laughs> right over here. Hi, um, speaking of the new ideas and stuff, uh, have you thought about returning to sitcoms in any way? Sitcoms? You know, <laughs> I come from a long and distinguished line of sitcoms. My father wrote them and his father before him. And I don't really... The one thing I loved about sitcoms, like multi-camera sitcoms, was that you just didn't have to write any stage directions. <laughs> you could just write all the jokes and leave, because um, I'm that lazy. But um, uh, I found that I was, I was more attracted to the long form. Um, they have melded so much. I mean, when I was coming up, it was the days when they were first trying single camera. They were doing Molly Dodd and Slap Maxwell and good shows that were just not quite hitting. Parent, the first Parenthood, which I worked on, um, which had an amazing cast and amazing writing staff, but no, everyone was like, it's half an hour of single camera. That will simply never work. Now, there's not really that distinction. And so they'd be fun, but I, I'd be very surprised if I found myself creating one because um, they're very seldom as fantastical as I like things to be. Um, I, can't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't have enough life experience to write about actual things, so I need them to have like wings and spaceships and bells and whistles. Hi. You obviously have an amazing body of work, and... Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what I do is, in the morning... No, 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 I, I got a dollar. Um, I think I heard that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you have a particular genre of storytelling that you prefer. I mean, you've done documentaries, you've done sci-fi, you've done action. Is there something that you would like to explore further or something that has surprised you in that, in that work? Well, you know, I don't think I've gone far enough. The one, the one thing that I haven't been able to film, because the answer is everything, so I have to choose by what, uh, what dream I haven't realized yet, and that's dance. That's really not me dancing. I've already mastered that. But um, uh, no, but uh, filming like a film musical that's you know, really about movement. Um, you know, I'm hoping to get in on the Step Up franchise, maybe like number seven. <laughs> step up to the retirement home. Ah, really I've fallen and I can't step up. <laughs> but, uh, but no, that is that, uh, a musical, yeah, my heart belongs there very much. Um, and so I, that's, that would be first on the list today. Hi, um, I was wondering what superhero story really inspires you the most right now? Inspires me now? Yes. Um, are, you, are you talking about like a current one superhero story? Or like Any superhero story ever. Any superhero story ever. Okay, that's, that narrows it down. <laughs> okay. I feel like I should say the Odyssey because that would be deep. But then there might be a follow-up question, and you'd find out that I haven't read it. So, um, uh, gosh, you know, that's, that's a tough one. But it's going to come back to Kitty Pride. I'm sorry. It does. 
because she was, you know, she was the avatar for a lot more of us than admit it. And I should probably admit it less often. Joss, over here to your left. Uh, hey, wow. Hey. I, I, Thanks I, for being here today. I feel I, like the first Batman. I have no peripheral vision. <laughs> I'm Batman. Or apparently RoboCop. I don't know what happened there. So. Um, I read that your first cut of Avengers was about three hours, and uh, I'm curious, are we going to see that footage in maybe like a Blu-ray release? And then also, you know, how did you decide to cut out, you know, 40 minutes of footage? Um, <clears throat> I didn't know it was going to be three hours when I shot it. Um, I'm going to grab some water here because I'm starting to sound a little hilarious. Talk amongst yourselves. Trick water, hard water. Oh, that's vodka. Um, <clears throat> okay, start again. Ask me that again. How were they cut this out? Right, the three hours. Um, basically, yes. There were things in the movie that I thought were necessary that we learned were not. And basically, most of it is the perspective of non-Avenger people um, to what's going on and sort of little other story, little through lines for other characters. Um, and there was, a, there was a bunch of stuff for Steve Rogers, sort of like not relating to the world. And I, I, when I was writing it, I felt very strongly that I needed it to keep the human perspective because I didn't think the Avengers were gonna, were gonna bring that. But then when we looked at the cut, they really were. People saw in them what they needed to see of humanity suffering. So um, I trimmed a lot of that out. I had a whole prologue thing with Maria Hill that um, I did because I felt from the start that I wanted to make this a war movie. That was the, f the very first time I ever said, I actually do want to do this. I said, I see this as a war movie. You can't just have a knockdown drag out with a bunch of superheroes. Um, so because that's too clean, it's too easy, and I have too many superheroes. The only thing bigger than these guys is going to be war. So that's the kind of film I wanted to make, and in order to do that, I wanted to set it up with basically a flashback structure, wherein it had happened, something bad went down, we don't know what, because the thing that war movies all have is you don't know if the people you're watching are going to live, but you know there was a war. You know something horrible happened, and I thought, well, these guys are going to spend a lot of time building as a team, I want to say up front, something horrible is coming. As it turned out, I didn't need to, and people, they wanted to get to the Avengers so much faster that, you know, that fell on the floor. There was nothing that we took out that didn't mean an enormous amount to me, that I didn't love when I shot it, and there's nothing that we took out that we shouldn't have taken out. Uh, one thing I will say about Marvel, they don't squeeze. Most studios will squeeze. They will try to get, oh, you left a small human moment in there. We gotta get rid of that or, you know. You know, I mean, it, it won't fit in the frozen section of the DVD store if, uh, if, it's, if it's not packed in enough. Um, and I kept expecting things to get cut out that, you know, besides these bits, um, that, you know, really held the texture of the movie and they, and they weren't. So it wasn't like, I was being browbeaten. I was looking at it going, you know, this is what I thought, and this is always the case in a movie, some of what you think you need, you don't. And then some of what you thought you didn't need, you go shoot later. Hi. I wanted to say first, thank you again for visiting with everyone who was camping out the other night for the panel. We really appreciate it, it was very special. My need for attention is so pathetic, it's amazing. No, it was so sweet. You guys, it was amazing. You guys were camping out. What up? That's crazy. My question for you is about Much Ado About Nothing. How, with all of the, the works of Shakespeare, with the plethora of works that there, there is out there, did you choose Much Ado About Nothing? Um, few things. Uh, it's very easily translatable. Um, I didn't even realize it when I chose it. It's all prose. And um, so it reads in a very modern fashion. It's very um, relatable for modern audiences. It really is, you know, the mama of all romantic comedies. Um, although there's also a darkness to it, sometimes. Um, and um, there was uh, a couple of other things. Um, I wanted to shoot something uh, sort of light. 
Uh, it has one location, so I shot it at my house. Um, so I didn't have to get a location. Um, and, uh, um, but probably the most important reason, besides the fact that I actually figured out what I, how I would do it and what I would want to say, is that years ago, we had had a Shakespeare reading in my backyard, and Amy and Alexis had read those parts before, and I knew that if I was ever going to film anything, it was going to be them. <laughs> Back here, in the back. Hi, thanks again for having us. Uh, first off, it'd be really hard to make a sequel, but how about Cabin in the Woods, the prequel? And then- Or the equal. <laughs> it goes on at the same time. And then I was just wondering, what are some of the things that you're reading and watching these days that uh, you're really into that you could share with the crowd? You know, um, <clears throat> I have not read for pleasure, um, nor watched um, an entire episode of television in a long, long while. Um, however, sometimes when I have trouble sleeping, I turn to Archer and, um, because there are so many life lessons. It's really, I think it's the wonder years for our generation. Um, uh, no, that, uh, but, um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I have a stack of things. It's like my entire life now is like the wire, you know, how the wire, the Wire is basically the new war and peace. It's the giant tome on your shelf that you mean to get to, that everybody's really pissed you have it because it's a classic, but it's going to take a while to get into it once you start it, and you're just any minute now. I mentioned that to a friend of mine, and they're like, yeah, but The Wire is awesome. I'm like, so is war and peace. <laughs> it's really, you just got to like, you got to make the commitment. But now that's with everything. I, there's so many shows I want to watch. Um, so I got nothing. I got nothing. I got Archer. Hey, Josh, uh, thank you very much. Um, my question was two-part. Um, what's, first of all, what's it like, the process of uh, working with your brothers? Uh, I'd like to know about that. And from when you were younger to kind of growing up, is that uh, something you've always done? Have you got been close and worked with them? And then the second part is, uh, what was your inspiration working with Drew Stoddard and Behind Cabin in the Woods? I mean, uh, where did you come up with that? It seemed to be a, a labor of love, to say the least. Yes, yes. Um, love and mutilation. Um, Drew Goddard and I, um, you know, we share a, a, a fairly demented sensibility. He's the guy who told me about Archer in the first place. Um, and I, the first time I watched Archer, I said to Drew, this, this show seems like something you mumbled in your sleep. I mean, it's so you, it's very, his subconscious is just horrible. It's a horrible place. Um, I don't actually know where the idea came from because I just had it. And then I was like, oh yeah, no, that there's the whole movie, boom. But I also know that Drew was the only guy that I could make that with because he was the only guy who would understand that there would have to be a unicorn. <laughs> um, goring a guy to death with its beautiful white horn. And um, so once, once you know that about a person, then, you, it, then it's go time. With my brothers, um, I, you know, they're, they're, we're actually half brothers. And um, uh, one of them is, Jed is 11 years younger than me, Zach 15 years younger than me. So um, I used to actually work with them because I would make little home movies. I'd come back from film school in college and be like, okay, you're eight, come on, you're, we're gonna make a noir. And, and, and I, mean, they were, I was doing all kinds of things I shouldn't have been in. But, um, uh, but then, you know, then they went off on their ways and we didn't work together at all until the strike. And we were nervous as kittens, all, all of us, that we were gonna like, either tear each other apart or, um, it's, it, like with Drew, it's so organic um, that it's almost like writing alone. We just, you know, except that every now and then I get more surprised and intimidated. Um, we have a real extraordinary rapport, and this also applies to Marissa. Um, we, uh, Jed's wife and, uh, you know, an extraordinary writer. We just, you know, it's, it's a room full of equals that I get to be in charge of. And, um, uh, and it's, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time building writers' rooms. You go through a lot of writers trying to find your team, and we fell into step, and a lot of that had to do with our sensibilities being similar and our influences, because the one writer uh, who was my absolute greatest influence that I forgot to mention was, of course, Stephen Sondheim. And Jed and I can pretty much just talk in a language that other people will have no idea what we're saying and, um, and build a song through that. Um, so it's, it's very organic. It's kind of beautiful, actually. Hi. Hello? Ah, magic. 
one of the reasons I really loved your work was the, the comedy, the humor. Are there any comics or comedians that you would love to work with? You know, um, there are many. And in fact, for Much Ado, I hunted down Ricky Lindholm from Garfunkel and Oates and um, uh, Nick and Brian from Britannic. I basically just cold called them like, will you come and be in my movie? Because I'm a fan of you. Um, and that led to, of course, my illustrious acting career as a poop coach. So, very proud of that. Um, but, um, and I got to work with Patton Oswalt on, um, on Dollhouse, which I still give myself enormous credit for because I had never seen him act. I had only heard some of his albums and I was like, yeah, this is the guy. He should play this part. He's going to own this part. I don't know why I knew that, but I was totally right. He was so good on that show. Um, I would love to work with him again. I watched him. He, had a, he did a gig a couple, on Thursday night. I got to go see here at San Diego. He's phenomenal. Um, Bo Burnham and Mike Birbiglia are two guys that I listen to a lot. Um, here's, 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 I used to listen to comedy albums a huge amount as a kid. And um, because back then we didn't have anything else. And... Um, uh, I've come back to it, and I'd like to thank L.A. Traffic for um, bringing me back to my roots because it's the only thing that keeps me from killing human beings with my car when I'm on the 405. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, Avengers is so... It ha it, it's a combining three, really four different movies and it had so much hype leading up to it. Was there ever a point where you felt like it was just too big, it was too hard to manage everything? Um, <clears throat> before I started, I sort of went, oh, wow, oh, ah, it's big, it's large, big movie, big movie. It's like, you know, I could see its fin in the water coming towards me. And, um, uh, you know, and my wife just set me straight. She was like, Joss, it's just the next story. And I was like, boom, great, no problem. And no, after that, never. Because ultimately, it is just the next story. Um, you have a set of problems that I've had so many times. Oh, the actor isn't available that day. Oh, the set isn't built yet. Oh, we can't get here. Oh, this doesn't work. Oh, I'm writing while I'm editing, while I'm shooting. I mean, it was basically like running a show. So, you know, when you're running a show, you're in the process of telling at least eight stories at the same time. And um, so you know, weaving them into one is a little harder, but very similar. Also, I'm super studly. However, um, I will say that I have this tendency to be like, <laughs> I was not bothered at all, and I'm not. I'm totally good, I'm in charge, I'm calm, and I know what I'm doing. I can't sleep, and my entire right side has seized up. <laughs> but apart from that, no, it's good, let's go. Come on, we're gonna take that hill, man. <laughs> so my body uh, is, just terrified of everything that happens, but I seem to be fine. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask, do you plan on doing any more writing for The Runaways? Writing for? For The Runaways. <laughs> oh, um, you know, I don't have any plans to write more Runaways right now because um, I uh, am too tired, but I, that was, one of the most fun experiences for me ever because um, Brian K. Vaughan is a master um, and was very sweet to me about taking it over. I love that book, I love that cast, and I got to do so much historical research to create the 1907 version of the Marvel Universe, and it's, you don't, you know, in fantasy, some people do a lot of science research, you know, a lot of things. Every now and then you gotta, you sink your teeth into it, but usually it's just like, you make it up. He's a gloompy demon, they can all hop. You know, whatever, it's your, it's your stuff. So really getting into the history of that, I love that piece so much. And uh, because every single character in that universe is based on some little reality of history or some phraseology or some belief and uh, except for like one that I just made up. Oh, yeah, uh, dead George Pelham. That guy's just a zombie. Hi, it's uh, Harry Clore. Um, Kevin and Brian uh, and I had a question, which is, you're a master storyteller. Would you ever have any interest in doing Dune? Dune? Yes. Um, wow, you know, it's never occurred to me. I, I am not, again, 
it's, it comes, it's weird coming from the guy who keeps shifting mediums. I'm not the adaptation master. I have one in my head that I read uh, in one sitting when I was 15 while eating these cinnamon candies that were like the spice. It was like I was eating the spice. Um, but I, um, uh, I, I remember seeing the movie and going, well, I don't want him to make it. But I didn't think, oh, I, I, I want to do this. Uh, that very seldom happens because when I, uh, a great novel to me, it's, it's gotten a little better, but usually a great novel doesn't make a great movie. Usually you're looking for something else uh, for a movie. And so I haven't really thought about it, but now you've made me think about it and now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> okay, I'm done, cool. Good. But I'm not thinking about Ender's Game because I, I still have no idea how they're gonna pull that off. I mean, I'm excited to see, but I, that, that one, that's, that's crazy talk. Okay. Hey, Joss, my name is Brad. Um, I asked you a question in the Dark, Dark Horse panel last year about uh, you do a lot of strong women, several lesbian characters, and I said, you ever thought about doing a gay male character? And you said you actually did have a specific thought about that at one point, but then never followed through, and you thought, maybe now is the time. And I know you have a million other projects on your plate, like perhaps Avengers, too, but uh, ever thinking about following through on having a gay, ma gay male character in the Buffy universe? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, we've out, even An out character, I guess plans. I should say. Sorry? <laughs> an out character, I guess I should say. Um, yes. Um, and uh, I've been thinking, I was thinking about a particular story that wasn't in the Buffy universe, but we, there has also been some talk about doing something in the Buffy universe. Um, but again, I cannot get spoilery about it. But yes, it's still, you know, I, I, sorry? Okay, I did, I, 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 are, you, are you telling me to wrap it up? Is it, is I'm like, saying it's still in progress, that's great. Okay, good. I thought you were like Bill Conti and the, uh, you know, Oscar orchestra, going, get the fuck off, leave. Um, uh, no, yeah, um, uh, you know, the, the thing is, it's an element of something I, you know, you need more than that, than the, uh, you know, you need more than, and I'm not saying this in a disparaging way, you need more than an agenda. You know, you need the story to come organically, um, or, and so, uh, and then you need to think up the outfits. So. Hi, Josh. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, on a personal note, I met my girlfriend in a midnight line at Walmart for Buffy season six. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's amazing to actually be able to tell you that part. Uh, two quick things. Um, first off, Avengers 2 would be awesome, but I could see you doing Guardians of the Galaxy much easier. I think you'd be able to handle that story, and I don't know if anybody else would. Um, but there's a lot of people going around, like Kevin Smith, releasing movies and touring with them, the guys from Repo and Devil's Carnival. Is that something maybe you'd look at in the future for, like, Dr. Horrible 2 or anything like that? I'm sorry. I miss, when, right after Kevin Smith, I stopped being able to hear Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, where they release their movies, they tour with them, the guys from Repo and Devil's Carnival, Kevin Smith, with stuff like that. We've actually talked about that, um, you know, potentially with Much Ado, if, if we don't, you know, land a distributor or something. You know, there's, there's definitely so many different ways to go about it. And uh, the homebrew is, is a very powerful drink for me right now. It's really, I mean, Dr. Horrible was the most fun that I ever had until Much Ado. So those things and, and these ways of getting them out there that are not the sort of set ways. Because the only thing about, honestly, I've worked with great studios, but it's, and, and, and I've worked with a network too. And, um, uh, and the, only, the only thing that is, is you know, they're, 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 they're so long ball on the game. They're like, this is the most magnificent thing. We can't wait to show it to people three years from now. And you're just like, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm impatient. I don't like that. So I'm very interested in doing that kind of thing. I just haven't figured out which is going to be for what, when, next. Thank you. I was wondering if we could go back to uh, Buffy for a moment. Um, about the character of Xander, about once every season or two, he would show a definite dark side, like not telling Buffy about the spell, and then um, once more feeling he basically gets away with uh, manslaughter about four times with no repercussions. Um, <laughs> Is oh, there, well, how did you feel about him having that sort of darker tone that just occasionally popped up? Most of the time he's this great guy, but then occasionally it's sort of like Dark Xander pops up out of the Phoenix. <laughs> you know, um, 
that moment where he didn't give the message to Buffy um, was like, a, I, I, it's so silly, I sound so silly. It was a pivotal thing for me because it wasn't evil. I don't even think it was wrong. It was just like, I was just, it was, he lied. And like, in a crucial thing to his, when it was one of his best friends about something very important. And I was just like, oh, wow. I don't know how I feel about this, except that it makes me feel awesome because he made him human. It made him a person with his own agenda. There is nobody who is always affable and delightful. And in fact, if somebody is too affable and delightful all the time, you gotta wonder what's gonna happen when they pop. And, you know, uh, Xander was the beginning of something for me as a writer of, uh, that I've pursued much more since of just, you know, it's fine, it's great, we're all that, you know, he's, he's a good guy, you can trust him, but guess what, you know, sometimes we fail, and sometimes, you know, the humor, self, some, some self-deprecating humor comes from rage. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but, um, uh, and, you know, I think that um, he's always been able to walk the f a fine line with that, and that's something we're actually pursuing in season nine in the comic as well. And I just, it, it excites me because it makes me feel close to him. It makes him human. Also, the manslaughter thing, because what? <laughs> I wasn't drunk drunk. I just, you know, driving around. Well, anyway. Um, hey. Hey, hi, Josh. Um, first act, thanks for organizing this. It's amazing. Um, Josh, you have done incredible storytelling with a lot of great universe. Um, I know that you're continuing Firefly uh, on comics. Um, have you ever thought of doing a Firefly video game? Firefly? Video game. Very much. Very much. And uh, I actually ran into Cliff Blazinski last night, and we were like, we got to do Firefly. Yeah, we're not sober. Um, but uh, um, we very, you know, it, I think it lends itself to a game. There was a lot of talk about doing a, a multiplayer, um, um, and... Um, uh, a massive one, and then and there was competing companies, and I took all these meetings, and then I, I, I turned around, and it had just sort of all disappeared, um, and I don't know why, uh, because I think uh, that verse is so ready for serious gaming, because there are so many things, there's so many worlds, so many kinds of ships, so many things to achieve, so many people to be, so many things to do besides killing, but a lot of killing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm all for it. I actually, I, that's one thing where I think they would, they would be perfect mates. But uh, I don't have that kind of money, so I'm, I'm just always waiting for somebody who does to come and say, okay, let's go, I have the rights. And they'll walk like this. <laughs> because, you know, they'll be from the 30s. When they walked like that, they did. Because of got, rickets. We got time for a couple more questions. Right here, on the left here, Jess. Uh, hi, Jess. Um, I know that you said um, before you started Much Ado About Nothing, you were supposed to go on vacation. So my question is, what keeps you constantly creating and like, keeps you from really, it sounds like, ever getting lazy? You know, it's funny. Um, people love the term workaholic, but nobody ever really uses the term workaholism. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, <laughs> I wish I were kidding. Um, it, uh, it makes me very twitchy if there isn't some kind of creation or some kind of advancement, culminations, learning something, doing something, but more than anything else, making something. Um, I had been working on Avengers nonstop. I had been living in Albuquerque for uh, like over a year just doing nothing but working. It was a month and two days after we wrapped that we started shooting Much Ado. And we shot for 10 days, and then we had two extra days the next weekend. And I came back to work like I'd been sitting on a beach, like so ready to go and full of energy. It feeds me. And you can't be around the kind of creative energy that the people I work with possess and not be fed. You can't do a scene with Reed Diamond and Clark Gregg and not come away just with your head blown off. I mean, it just, it's so glorious. So there's, um, you know, it's, it's, but it is also a problem. It is also a thing wherein I don't know, I don't really understand about relaxing um, and, uh, um, or being there for my friends, <laughs> apparently. 
first you have to make friends, and then when they have a problem, you have to be somewhere. I, I have, I'm still I'm reading about it, um, and uh, and it's it is an actual issue. You're, there's a distance between you and the world that actual other holics share, wherein you are. You're in your comfort zone. You're doing the thing that gives you comfort. Luckily, it's slightly less harmful than other things. It's creation. But um, sometimes I think, I need to get in the world. I need to get out of bed, get a hammer and a nail, that kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? But um, uh, at the same time, sometimes I think, no, I should just live in my head and create more stuff. Um, clearly, <laughs> this is a problem for me because I'm still talking about it. So let's move on. <laughs> Hi, Josh. Um, I was wanting to know, um, you kind of have are known for killing your characters. Yeah. <laughs> and we're in. <laughs> and I was just wondering, when you start riding, do you have an idea if you're going to kill somebody, or is it just happen while you're riding? And like, how do you decide, I want this person to die, does it serve a purpose, and which character like to pick? You know, it's, you know, you, you, you love to kill, and then you're, but like, is it a, is it a musical or is there a spaceship? I, I know I want to kill this guy. Um, no, um, I, you know, I've openly said that I get a little cranky about this question. No offense, um, because, you know, I would like, you know, always to mention the percentage of people who die is a lot. I think it's pretty near everybody. The percentage of people that I kill, not so many. I think the reason that uh, my rep is so nasty is that I tend to do it um, unexpectedly um, or to someone people are recently invested in. And that is a real mission statement for me because death doesn't leave a card. Death doesn't go, death doesn't, it doesn't take Hitler. Okay, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work according to story plans. And when a death feels like a loss, gives you grief, then you have told a story that involves death. It is a completely different thing than, and then the hero says, no, I'm not going to kill you, but think about what you've done. And then he walks away, and then the villain pulls out the smaller gun that he has, and the hero turns around, kills him, boom. Oh, it's okay. You know, that's the convenient movie, death. That's great. Oh, the bad guy died. Um, but that isn't anything like the experience of death in life. So if people, if I have this reputation, it's because I'm doing something right. And not something great, but it's something right. We got, we got uh, time for a couple more. A couple more. We're going to squeeze it out. We're going to squeeze it out. Um, Josh, you talked, yesterday, oh, you talked yesterday about how important Tim Minear was to writing Firefly. And I'm just wondering how, when you pick your writers, how, how you pick them and how you divide up the work when you're doing that. Um, <clears throat> how do you divide up the work? Um, you know, uh, every team, you know, obviously the Firefly team, I had... Tim and I, you know, I had Gene, I had some people that I had worked with before, and, and, um, and, and I got really lucky uh, with the rest of the team. Um, you kind of, you, you find out people's strengths early on, basically, in the room, and we were talking a little bit about this with the fact that Jose could actually structure a plot uh, way better than the rest of us, and that doesn't mean he couldn't write emotion or come from character, it just meant that, like, he had those, like, building block skills that are really important for a lot of storytelling that, you know, some of us are not as facile with. And um, some people are rock stars in the room. My brother Jed brought him on to uh, um, Dollhouse with still more trepidation, what is it going to be like, and suddenly he's, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with my near. I've never seen anybody do that. I mean, it's, you know, and, and those people in a room are incredible, and, and then some people, they never say a word, but then they turn in a draft, and you're weeping, they've totally nailed it. So you just kind of, you just, you, you feel everybody out, and it's like with your cast. You know, if you find, wow, this guy's really good at comedy, and that's not what he's playing, we're gonna throw something his way. Oh, they can sing, let's do that. You know, you sort of, you, you, you find it out, and uh, it can be a, it can, there can be a lot of triage, you know, a lot of people came and went on Buffy, who seemed like a perfect fit, um, but, uh, and, you know, 
Uh, but by the end of that, you know, the team I had was so stellar. And then the other thing is you just keep hiring people over and over again if they'll still work for you because uh, then you don't have to meet new people, which, as I explained earlier, is a problem for me. All right. Is the last question. No pressure whatsoever. Has to be the best, though. <laughs> Who's got the mic? Hello. Hi, Joss. Um, my question is on Avengers. After two kind of mediocre Hulk movies, how do you make Hulk like the coolest character on the Avengers? Definitely not the worst question. Um, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, incredibly hard work uh, is part of the equation. Um, the moment that uh, Mark and I sat down together to talk about whether or not he wanted to do the part, we got into a discussion about rage and what it really meant. And the very last shots that were delivered were Hulk shots. And the entire time we were doing it, in between, was a process of trying to get it right. And that meant getting his performance right, figuring out who Bruce Banner was, and we both instantly said, well, it's clear he's Bill Bixby. Um, you know, he's helping other people. He's the fugitive, but sometimes he's bigger. And, um, um, you know, he's not so focused on his own problems. That was a big thing. And then Mark is one of the most extraordinary actors and incredible mensch, and you just, it just bleeds through onto the screen. You just can't not know that. But um, when he just makes his scary face, oh, yeah, he's just terrifying, and it's great because um, he can, you know, he, he's just making a face. He's not really mad at me, I don't think. Um, um, and, uh, and I got to wrestle with him, too. We actually, we actually put down some mats and we wrestled because we were trying to figure out like, how would the Hulk fight, and that was really fun. Um, but, uh, you know, and then I worked a lot with the animators uh, after the performance capture stuff to sort of take it further and, and really get that iconic feeling from the Hulk that, um, you know, I felt the first one, you know, first one doesn't look bad for that time. Um, and uh, it's just, it's really a question of what's motivating him. What's pissing him off now? Like, you know, we, how do we keep that intensity up? That was a big thing for his physicality. The second movie, I just felt like, you know, he was surfing. I mean, he was just like ripped, and he had long hair, and it's just like, Hulk smash. <laughs> 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 You're like an abomination. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but, and, but the Hulk is a particular problem, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. No, 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 take your time. I think we should let him take his time, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, basically, um, not just the physicality, but the Hulk is a very difficult problem because he's not really a superhero, he's more of like a universal horror movie. He's, he's the werewolf. And, um, uh, but he's also an Avenger. Um, does that make sense? No. Did it make sense in 1963? It did not. <laughs> um, part of the joy of this movie was like, wait a minute, none of this makes any sense. This is gonna be fun. So, um, uh, the structure of how he is, appears in the movie was done very specifically to, because one of the things that they always did was like, oh, no, I feel myself changing around a bunch of evil bullies who deserve to die. What will happen? Um, please don't let me change. And then he's just like the guy who's standing in the way of the Hulk, and that's annoying um, and convenient. So the structure of doing the first Hulk sequence as a horror movie specifically where there is a damsel in distress, a person that we care about that he wants to kill, that he is actually angry at before he's the Hulk, um, was very important. And then the second time, um, when he's being the hero version, um, it was important that A, he had made the decision to change, that you know he sort of let himself go. And then we got to have the other thing that I felt the, the Hulk movies didn't quite get at in the same way that I wanted to, which is the joy of it just the childlike joy. Because rage has so much delight in it. When you really let yourself go, it's an incredible feeling. And then afterwards, it's shameful and it's awful and you have these enormous purple shredded pants and you're like, that just seems weird. I don't, I don't, I don't like purple. But, um, uh, but, but during, there's, you know, the part of the thing that makes the Hulk 
so much fun is that he's that you're a little bit having a good time when you're when you're losing your shit and um, and uh, and then I think the last thing was because we did the Loki thing. <laughs> so, I don't mean to boast, <laughs> but that shit was hilarious. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together I for Josh Whedon. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Yeah. Let it Thank you guys so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for the, all the money you've raised in this panel. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the con. Spend time with us here at Nerd HQ. You'll be exiting out those doors to your left. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.